This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to worship with the Presbyterian Church in Morristown. We are so pleased that you are with us. I am thrilled, I am beyond thrilled to share with you that the session has voted to resume in-person worship outside at the Parish House parking lot beginning May 9th at 10 a.m. We will plan a month at a time during these COVID times, everything shifts. We will continue to pre-record and release worship services in case of rain or cicadas. More details will be forthcoming, but we just needed to share this news. We're very excited. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Please join me in the responsive call to worship. We gather to worship the Good Shepherd. Who lays down his life for his sheep. We gather to worship Jesus Christ. Who calls us to lay down our lives for others. Easter people, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Let us now confess our sins against God and our neighbors using the words of our unison prayer of confession. O oh God, you have called us to love, not in word or in speech, 
but in truth and action. You have laid down your life for us and commanded us to lay down our lives for one another. Still, O oh Lord, we offer empty thoughts and prayers when the world needs our hands and our feet. Still, O oh Lord, we fail to share our lives with the world, hiding behind a myth of self-sufficiency. Forgive us, we pray, and by your forgiveness, raise us to new life in you. Amen. God's mercy is from everlasting to everlasting. May the God of mercy who forgives all our sins strengthen us in all goodness and keep us in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Good morning. There are lots of children's stories that have the big bad wolf in them. There's the three little pigs and the big bad wolf tries to blow down their houses. There's Little Red Riding Hood, and the wolf dresses up as the grandma and tries to trick Little Red Riding Hood. And there's Peter and the wolf. In all of these stories, the wolf is the bad one, the one that you want to stay away from. In our Bible story today, Jesus tells us about a shepherd. The shepherd is Jesus, some sheep, that's us, and a wolf, and that is God's enemy. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, that is not the shepherd, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. Jesus is telling us that he will never leave us. He loves us, he cares for us, and he'll watch over us. He will not let the big bad wolf get us. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for sending your son Jesus to be our good shepherd. He gave his life for us. Help us to follow him and trust him to keep us safe. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please join me in our prayer for illumination. Almighty God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, open your word and illumine our world that we may see clearly and live faithfully by the light of your truth in Jesus Christ, amen. Today's reading is Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right path for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod, your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell with the house of my Lord forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second scripture reading today comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verses 11 through 18. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I follow a shepherd named James Rebanks on Instagram. His family have been shepherds in the Lake District of Northwest England for generations, and they raise Herdwick sheep. 
You can follow him too. His handle is Herdy, H-E-R-D-Y, Shepherd One. He's also, as it turns out, an elegant writer. He's written a book called The Shepherd's Life, about the seasons of the year, shepherding. And he's just published a new book called English Pastoral. I also ended up following his wife, Helen Rebanks, and she posts as the shepherd's wife. Following both of them on social media allows a glimpse of the all-encompassing nature of the shepherd's life. It is lambing season in Northwest England this month, and so this month the family's schedule is eat, sleep, lamb, repeat, over and over. Ewes carrying a single lamb can do fine on their own, but ewes that carry twins need help to birth them. James Rebanks writes about the all-nighters that are pulled, about the multiple times that they drive the all-terrain vehicles up and down the fells to check on those that are delivering, to check on newborn lambs. If it's snowy in April, then they have to deliver food to the ewes. The responsibility is endless and enormous. The occasional loss of you or lamb is devastating. Eat, sleep, lamb, repeat. And the cycle is lambing, haying, shearing, doctoring, mating, field upkeep. There's this whole cycle throughout the year of shepherding and it never ends. The care and feeding of a flock is a constant responsibility. Shepherds were, of course, familiar figures in the ancient Near East, in the biblical world. Animals were the wealth of a family. And small subsistence farmers lived above their animals in the same building, animals on the ground. Shepherds with flocks of sheep or goat would graze them wherever there was food available. So shepherding was a nomadic life. It was also a very dangerous life. Shepherds slept with the flocks to keep them together, to protect the flocks from predators. Some of those predators were human. The care and feeding of the flock was fundamental to the health and welfare of the family. In the Bible, shepherd is a metaphor for leadership, a metaphor that of course would be readily understood in the biblical world. Rulers referred to themselves as the shepherds of their peoples. There is, of course, shepherding imagery throughout scripture. You will remember uh, from the Messiah, he shall feed his flock like a shepherd, and he shall gather the lambs with his arms from Isaiah 40. The title of shepherd was claimed by rulers who conquered the region, there were many of them, as well as the very long line of inept kings of the northern and southern kingdoms of Israel and Judah. Therefore, shepherd was also understood to be a metaphor for failed human political leadership. In contrast to the false shepherds who rule over their people and care only for the wealth and the power of being a ruler, God the shepherd is the foil. So God the shepherd in Ezekiel 34 cares for the well-being of the sheep. And God the shepherd in Psalm 23 provides water and food and shelter for the sheep. Every funeral I've ever planned or presided at has included Psalm 23. When we read or we hear those words, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, we experience comfort and reassurance. That phrase, the Lord is my shepherd, is also a defiant and faithful challenge to the ineptitude of human leadership, whatever the age, 
and whatever the polity, because what the psalmist is saying is, the Lord is my shepherd, not the current Yahoo who happens to hold the title of king or whatever. It's the Lord who is my shepherd. That's who I'm going to follow. So there's actually an edge to it that we don't hear. In today's lesson from John 10, we're in the middle of actually the great shepherd discourse in John 10. It is Jesus speaking, of course, and Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. I know my own and my own know me. I find those words so comforting during this time of COVID isolation. We may be isolated. Some of us have been on our own for months now, but Jesus, the Good Shepherd, hasn't lost sight of us, knows each of us, cares for each of us, has laid down his life for us. We are known individually, not just part of the flock, but known individually and loved by the one who will seek each one of us off of those snowy fells, find us if we're lost in the desert, and will bring us back to safe pastures. The ever watchful Good Shepherd knows us by name, Jesus says a couple times in the Gospel of John. In this age of loneliness and isolation, to be known by God through the body of Christ is a remarkable gift, an extraordinary gift. Jesus knows his sheep, his sheep know him. Christian community gives us the gift of being known by God through the body of Christ, which is the church, which is the flock. We want to be known by others. We want to be understood for who we are, accepted for who we are and what matters to us. And we want to know other people the same way. How does this congregation help people to be seen and cherished and known? How do we help the community with whom we interact to be seen and cherished and known? I'm in ministry because I was seen and cherished and known by my home church. I was raised in Louisville in a Presbyterian church. I grew up in youth group and young life in the 70s in a church whose theology I would not now claim. But they knew me and they loved me and they made a place for me and they launched me into ministry. Church was my safe place. When I was there, I was known. I was known. I had a place and a role and I mattered. I suspect that's true for many of us here at the Presbyterian Church in Morristown. This flock is the place where you are known and you matter. People know your family. These people have known and helped you raise your children who are now grown. They knew your spouse. It's not just about this building, right? It's not just about getting back into this building. It's about this flock, right? It's about us together, the flock. We've been seen and known and herded into this community by God who gave us to one another. There are lots of flocks. You may or may not have been following the drama and it has been super drama. Uh, around the now on hold proposed Super League in European football, soccer. I myself live in a divided household of Arsenal and Liverpool supporters. And this new league proposal was made by the owners. Um, and it was about the money, of course. Uh, the managers, the players, the fans were not consulted. As it turns out, this proposal kind of collapsed over a 48 hour of period of time. 
there was fan outrage. And outrage is not actually a strong enough word. <laughs> there was fan outrage about this proposal for this new Super League in which teams would play brand new teams. And I think the outrage is about several things, actually. Uh, tradition, European football is really traditional. Um, tribalism, but at its heart, the outrage is about the deep fear of losing this deep community, of knowing and being known within one's flock, one's Liverpool flock, right? Serious soccer fans for generations have found identity and acceptance and deep communion within the rituals of their club. It is sacred space. It is also a very profane space, quite literally, <laughs> but it is sacred community. It is a flock. So it has been a tough week <laughs> for European soccer, but it looks like things might settle down a bit. We, of course, experience the same deep sacred communion with each other uh, within the community of the Presbyterian Church in Morristown, community with each other and community with God. Here are just a few ways that I've learned in these last three months a few ways that this flock helps our people to know and be known. I think of the caregiver group that is convened by Pastor Sarah. Caregivers are people who are um, sharing a season together of really difficult, challenging time to be the caregiver for someone else. Um, they gather together and they share their burdens. I think of the Stephen ministers who have been trained to walk with people who need committed companionship over a period of time. I think of the partnerships that we have with Nourish and Jay. I think of the new partnership that we are building with Morris area together. These are not just things we are doing, right? In service with and to the community, we are expressing our commitments and we are sharing our souls with one another and trusting each other with that. To know and to be known. I think of our ministry with young people, the adults who commit to our young people by being confirmation sponsors, by being involved in the youth program, by going on trips with them, um, by ringing bells with them, by being adults in young people's lives. Our young people learn in their bones, right? That they are loved in Christ's name just because they are, just because they're here. Not because of their GPAs, not because of some other achievement, whatever it is. They're just loved because they're here and they're part of the flock. The hired hand, Jesus tells us, doesn't have the same commitment to the sheep that the shepherd has. The shepherd gives up everything, right? It's lambing season, that's all you do. The shepherd gives up of their time, their energy, their other commitments, their very lives to promote the welfare of the flock. There is no amount of money that could repay that kind of commitment. In a Presbyterian church, the shepherds are the pastors and the session. And so I think about the multiple extra meetings and responsibilities and time that the staff and the session have shared around pandemic life, right? Thinking through closures and protocols and processes over and over during the last year as things keep shifting your session has worked so hard for this congregation this year. A good shepherd of any flock is all in, right? All in, not part way in, <laughs> not the hired hand, all in. This session, the accompanying task forces and safety committees have been all in this year and continue to be all in.
They have led us well. Being all in, diving all in, being present and there and nowhere else, calls for risk and it calls for sacrifice and it calls for commitment. Risk, sacrifice, commitment. I think the challenge for us in this text is to consider for what are we all in? Presbyterian Church in Morristown. For what are we all in? What would we, what will we, what are we willing to sacrifice for? Right? All in. For what commitments are we willing to make sacrifices? We'll be thinking about that as the discernment team begins its work uh, this weekend and invites others into that work as well. What are we all in for? Eat, sleep, lamb, repeat. I know my own and my own know me just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. Thanks be to God. Amen. Hi, I'm Gretchen Doner. I'm a member of this church and a resident of Denville. After George Floyd's death, I participated in a march in Denville and was very impressed by the quality of the speakers, the organization, and the number of residents in attendance. But afterwards, I was like, what now? And what could I possibly do as an individual? And then I saw in the Tower Tidings my answer. There was an invitation to join a Zoom call with Morris Area Together. It's a nonpartisan coalition of 18 congregations and nonprofit organizations in our community looking at issues in our community. After the call, we did a listening campaign, and thank you, many of you answered the survey. And we discovered that a lot of the issues fall into three categories, housing, criminal justice, and mental health and addiction. So from there, many of us joined committees where we interviewed organizations and individuals to discern the problems. And we came up with concrete initiatives that we're gonna propose to our elected officials. So here's what you can do as an individual please join us on a Zoom call just one hour from your couch on Monday, May 10th at 7.30 p.m. We want the elected officials to see how many people are behind these initiatives to help our brothers and sisters that are less fortunate. We want them to scroll through pages of all these faces in our community. And as members of a church that has committed to be a Matthew 25 congregation, this is a great way to help those less fortunate than us. So please join us and I hope to see you in a Zoom box. Thank you. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it. We invite you to give your praise and thanks to God with your gifts of support for the ministry of this particular flock, the Presbyterian Church in Morristown. Thank you. Let us now open our hearts and minds in prayer to God. Gracious shepherd, generous provider, you know when our bodies need the gift of lying down in peace, when our minds need the soothing of still waters, and when our souls need restoring. So often the worries and cares of this life loom large and overwhelm us. We give you thanks and praise that even before we ask, you offer us blessings of well-being. And even when we aren't aware, you walk with us through life's dark valleys. With boldness, then, we pray for our troubled world. God of all goodness and mercy, we pray for our nation and the nations of the world. There are so many wolves who stalk our communities and seek to do violence. Our streets ring with gunshots. 
and we remain frozen in a perpetual cycle of mourning and grief. Pour out your comfort and grace upon those victimized by gun violence. Turn the hearts of those who prize weapons over lives. And anoint all leaders with your wisdom so that they will use their power to help the poor, defend the vulnerable, and establish a greater reign of peace. We pray for your church in every place. Gather us together and make us one in ministry and mission to the world so that we may truly be one flock following you, our one shepherd. Give us ears to hear your voice above all others and fill our hearts with courage to respond in faith to your invitation. We pray for our community. Strengthen those who work each day to heal the sick, welcome the outcasts, and help sisters and brothers in need. Guide our steps as we seek to reopen more facets of life amidst the ongoing pandemic. Speed the positive effects of vaccination and continue to foster our creativity to move forward in a way that will be life-giving for all. Help us collectively balance our economic, social, educational, religious, and recreational needs with the prevailing need to maintain safety and preserve life. We pray for our friends and loved ones, for Betty, Joyce, Pat, and all those we name before you now. Comfort all who are suffering, walk with them through dark valleys and restore them in body, mind, and soul. Uplift caregivers and strengthen them for their holy work. Loving God, by the power of your spirit, help us to keep your commandments and to love one another with the love of Jesus, our shepherd, who laid down and took up his life again for our sake. We ask all this in his holy name as we join in the words he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
and now receive the benediction. May the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit abide with you this day and remain with you always. Amen.